Someone yesterday at the seminar began uh, just before my remarks by asking me, what is the commons? How, how do you define this? Can you define it simply? And I said, I think there's two definitions that always help me center myself in the, in the commons, in that space. The first is kind of cognitive, which is uh, the commons is uh, something that is not privatized and it's not regulated by the state. And it, it has to do with common resources that fall outside of that area. But as a caveat, many of the common resources that we share are actually either privatized or um, regulated by the state. So it's both a matter of recognizing that the air we breathe and our relationships and um, the, the, the kinds of things we know as common space in nature uh, are, uh, are commons. But at the same time, recognizing that things like water, which is being privatized, um, the airwaves, electromagnetic space, which is being regulated by the state, those are commons that really belong to people uh, as part of their common heritage and yet have been uh, outsourced by us for the, you know, the management of, of those resources, has been outsourced by us to the private sector or to the state. And that's the broader political economic explanation of why we find ourselves now uh, advocating for the commons, which is uh, an ancient concept, really. And then the second aspect is that as part of that uh, dialectic, private, state, commons, part of that dialectic, I find that grounding myself in the phenomenology of the commons is very vital and it's essential, meaning the beingness of the commons, which means being present, being present with other people, being present with myself, and being present with a group, and by definition, the commons is not only community. It's community that self-organizes to manage a resource, a common resource. So we can talk about the commons as a community, but it's rather meaningless if it's just community space of conversation with no particular object. If the object then is the management of a shared resource, it could even be a knowledge commons that we're managing ideas. But there has to be some object or some thing that's being um, addressed that helps us to um, uh, thrive or evolve or something meaningful or something of significance to us that is uh, important as to us as individuals as well as to the group that, in which we're engaged. Um, it's this second component that really we're going to be addressing today and it has to do with accountability because accountability is an important part of that beingness, it seems to me. Um, accountability to ourself, accountability to the group, accountability one-on-one -on -one with, with other people. And the title of this discussion today is how we've lost the accountability that civilizations once had and how we can get back to that type of accountability. Uh, it's a huge generalization to assume that, uh, that all civilizations of the past were really more accountable than, than we are today, and that uh, we're going to recover some kind of grand um, prehistory that uh, there was a perfect state of accountability among humanity, because the historical record clearly indicates that it wasn't so. Um, yet, we do know from the work of Eleanor Ostrom, to whom this series of talks this week is dedicated and who passed away this past summer after a glorious career and of introducing us all to the commons. 
Um, it's clear from the historical record of anthropologists and scholars like Ostrom and many others that communities all through history have been able to self-organize to manage their own resources. And that self-organization involved uh, two aspects, really. One was that they could produce the resources together, co-production, and that they could govern the resources, or they could govern themselves in the co-production of the resources, which is co-governance. Those two aspects are vital when we're talking about the commons. And the catalyst here is that, it, it seems to me, is that we can't meaningfully talk about co-management and co-production unless we're talking about the implicit relationships between ourselves as individuals, which makes that co-production and co-governance possible. And I don't want to lump co-production and co-governance together too, too far along here because they are very different kinds of processes, but bear with me at the beginning because I'm generally referring to them as both processes which are highly dependent on accountability. And just to, just to anchor this a little bit, uh, it seems that we, we need to have a, the frame of reference of what's happening today um, if people in small communities historically were able to manage their own resources and produce their own resources. What's happened today, it seems, is a historical process in which we've now outsourced our power to manage our own resources and to produce our own resources to the market. In particular, our, our power to produce our own resources, we've outsourced or, or given that power to um, the marketplace, businesses, commercial enterprises. And we've given our power to manage our resources over to a regulatory apparatus in government. And it's, it's taken away from us a special kind of capacity that we have. Uh, we, the capacity is still within us. It's part of uh, human, part of being human to be able to have this particular capacity. But in the name of efficiency and modernity, and also in the name of ideology, uh, we have uh, projected or, or, or given this, these powers away to the, to the marketplace and to the state. And what is that capacity? And uh, well, the state and the marketplace talk about accountability. Uh, the, 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 the market is, uh, has, a, has a consumer ethic. They want to be accountable to the consumers. Uh, the state has the same kind of uh, pledge that as part of the social contract that they want to be accountable to the citizens of the state. So why can't we just talk about accountability in those terms? Because that realm of accountability has failed us. When we speak of the lack of democracy or democracy deficit in the area of uh, our relationship with the state as citizens. And we also talk about the shortfall we feel in terms of the top-down uh, provision of goods coming from uh, the private sector to us. We appreciate these goods. We, we, it's it's uh, been vital for our development over several centuries to have a commercial market society. It's, it has many benefits. We're not trying to criti criticize that, but my point only here is that the idea of accountability in both government and market now has a different meaning at that level vis-a-vis -vis us as human beings, whether it's as consumers or citizens. There's a different meaning than what we mean by accountability in our interpersonal relationships. We can start with that by just saying, you know, are we truly accountable to ourselves? And uh, that's a little more difficult to explain, but um, we, can, we can investigate that a little bit further. 
if we are whole people, which is a new ethos over the last 50, 60 years to talk about the integrated individual, the person who um, understands the ramifications or the influences of transpersonal psychology and has, has spiritually grounded and has evolved into a, a kind of integrated state of consciousness uh, and lifestyle. This is an ideal that uh, many of us hold dearly and yet it's interesting that in taking part in a society in which the state is not necessarily accountable to us nor is the marketplace accountable to us fully. Um, it's hard for us as individuals to be accountable to ourselves. So what's inherent in the social institutions that we have now, whether it's the, the market or the state, is a kind of bifurcation of understanding through the division of labor. The division of labor divides the world into producers and consumers. And it divides the world into uh, the regulators and the regulated. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have that knowledge within us that that's the way the external world operates, it reifies any kind of inherent split that we may have between mind and body in ourselves. So that we can go into ourselves and have the experience of oneness, but when we come back out into the world, that's not the signals you know, that we get from, from the institutions and rules in, in which we engage and, and take part. So the accountability to ourselves, the way I see it, uh, it begins with trying to break that kind of influence that the external world has upon us as individuals. And then also being able to have the experience one-on-one -on -one with other people which is so vital. Uh, rarely uh, do we fully engage with other people unless they're our immediate family or, or our immediate accountable partner, our, our husband or our wife or our child or our parent. That's where the, the real sacred relationships still take place. And, uh, and it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's part of the human ethic to to preserve those kinds of experiences. And that's most people's frame of reference, I think, into the world of accountability, where we know that we, by virtue of having those personal ties, that we are um, very prepared to go the extra mile and for, for the people that we're closest to. And it's an interesting <coughs> process to look into someone's eyes and to say, I really affirm you as a person, I think you're absolutely marvelous, and I, you, you don't know how much I appreciate you. It's it's a tremendous thing to 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 do that, to acknowledge someone from the depths of your heart. And uh, do we get that from the state or the marketplace? That's my point. That accountability is about really establishing that personal connection with someone, and then. Um, and then being as good as your word, you know, I, you know, we're in developing a, a trusting relationship, and as a result of that, um, we can build on that, and that is um, something that's extremely important. Human ties uh, are are absolutely vital to our understanding of mind and life and matter, and it's those it's that deep sense of relationship that we all have, which ties us to our ancestors. Because surely they experienced that, or we wouldn't be here today. If there was nothing but war and chaos in history, and there was plenty of that, no doubt. Uh, but if it was so self-destructive, if we all had selfish genes and we had no cooperative genes whatsoever, uh, we wouldn't be here. So we're carrying that torch forward. And yet, at the same time, we're dealing with things that our ancestors never dealt with. They didn't deal with a, a huge, monopolistic, bureaucratic, centralized, monolithic state. And they never dealt with corporate corruption and the kind of hypocrisy that we see in uh, the uh, corporatocracy to, uh, of today. 
So that overarching institution, I don't see as the market and the state, I see it as the market state. Because what's evolved now is rather a, a unified kind of um, hegemonic uh, system which discriminates against the citizen consumers that we are, and yet is dependent upon us to keep that system going. Now this isn't to make it sound like it's a radical kind of politics or that uh, we should be uh, enraged that, that this situation has developed like this. It's just the place that we find ourselves in. But it's important to identify that that's our power relationship right now. And for me personally, Commons is a way of understanding accountability in a new way. To break the, the means by which the market state is defining accountability. And to re really recapture what accountability means to us as individuals and with a historical reflection on what it must have meant to our ancestors without really knowing because we weren't there. And, and the work in the commons ties us to the ancient cultures through the present day indigenous cultures which we encounter, which still practice those earlier ethics of accountability. And that accountability really is, has about uh, the, it, its subject is about survival skills and, and what is meaningful to people in the community. When, when people were making promises to each other to do certain kinds of work and promises that they would devote their lives and energy and attention and time to another person, it had to do with the management of resources. And this is still the area in which we are engaged today. But because the resources of the planet are pretty much outsourced and the provision of resources to us are outsourced to, to suppliers in a kind of top-down envir environment, what we're really looking for now is really ab about accountability from the bottom up. Can we be accountable to ourselves to create a bottom-up kind of process in society that would make a difference to counteract the top-down uh, system that's at work? We're not going to abolish the top-down system. It's there to stay. But at the same time, we can change the energy flow in society greatly by establishing um, a bottom-up bottom kind of accountability, I believe. And that will transform this top-down structure that we, that we currently have. Because that top-down structure, as I said, was not always there. It's developed over the last couple of centuries. But many of you, all of you in your lifetimes, have seen this intensify over the last 40 years. It's gotten extremely top-down. As I said, it's been that way for a long time, but now we're seeing a polariz such a polarization in that social structure that we're recognizing that something has to be done. Some, some new kind of transformative process needs to take place that brings us to a greater realization of the commons. And that's why I'm talking now about the accountability that really generates the commons and makes it a very special and sacred, if you will, kind of space to enter into. Because indeed, if you look at it, the commons is, is essentially a, a spiritual kind of phenomenon. I said earlier that it was about phenomenology and about being and being present, and, but it has a spiritual component as well. Because the, the sacredness of the commons goes way back. Now, in the beginning was the commons. It wasn't called the commons. We had no reason to call it the commons because it was just society and nature. And small communities living in isolated areas that only negotiated on their um, peripheries occasionally and maybe had conflict <coughs> on, their, on their peripheries, but they were managing ecosystems. They were managing their resources within locales. And it was easy to operate on that level of accountability when it, within communities, when the communities were small enough to manage effectively. As they got bigger, then we had a need to create larger forms of government and then eventually a kind of marketplace that could effectively provide services and goods that we 
couldn't um, generate within our communities. In 1968, Garrett Hardin wrote an essay in Science Magazine called The Tragedy of the Commons. And he said that a group of cow herders uh, would share a pasture. And each of them had an, an individual incentive to maximize the amount of cattle that they could raise. So this Im implied that they could all put their cattle into the into pasture and they could all benefit from that. But what happens is if you do that, <laughs> without any agreements to restrict the number of cattle you put into the pasture, you're going to have the pasture overgrazed very quickly. And his point was, this proves that only the marketplace and only the state could intervene to manage this kind of commons effectively, because really people are too stupid to do it themselves. <laughs> that was his main point. Uh, and, and that's assumed by, by people that have grown up in our generation and before that, because that's the idea that people are, are ill-equipped to be able to manage their own resources. And this is part of the ideology that I'd said before that has come to us from Western civilization, that people can't do this for themselves. And this ideology has been created by the bourgeoisie and by the, by the market state itself. And we still hear this. This is very disempowering, but many, many of us believe this. And generations and generations go by where we become increasingly disempowered and now, as I say, over the last 40 years of neoliberalism, 30 to 40 years, depending upon how you look at it, um, we are becoming uh, very much disenfranchised and disconnected from the capacities that we have, but we just uh, have let slip away within ourselves. And the, the, the main capacity that I'm here to emphasize now is accountability. It has a, a very different meaning at the level of the market state than it has for us. It has to do with this generative understanding that when we connect with other people, something really meaningful takes place. And it's on that basis, when we're able to do that, that we really connect, we really understand all the different aspects of what it is to manage our resources within a community, whether, whether the value and the work that you're um, experiencing right now is just the attention that you're putting into this conversation or the value that you're deriving from it we're create well, this is a production process in some sense right now and it's that kind of understanding that we can apply to the management of commons not just in an environment like this but across the world and it's that vital connection that gives me the confidence and hope that we can actually create this bottom-up um, kind of movement to counteract that top-down movement, which is so oppressive and, um, and really will, will stifle the future of the planet.